Well, if we take a sort of a brief history tour of the study of paleoceanography, we have to go back to the 1870s and the Challenger expedition. It was among the very first oceanographic expeditions to explicitly take cores out of the bottom of the ocean. So they collected lots of sediment cores. Studies of the remain, remains of a particular organism called a foraminifera, and we'll see that in just a few minutes, they're sort of like amoebas with calcareous shells. Studies by a German oceanographer, Wolfgang Schott, revealed that the shells or these different organisms, these foraminifera, seem to have some relationship with the water temperature. So Wolfgang Schott was really the first scientist to make a link between the kinds of organisms that we find in sediments and the ocean temperature. And that's a very important link because it helps us to be able to use fossils to infer something about temperature in Earth's past. Here's what a foraminiferin looks like, and you can see the sort of nodules of its shells. It has these spikes or these sorts of uh, appendages that it uses to collect these little dots, which are phytoplankton. So it has these sort of um, calcareous spikes and calcareous shell in which the organism lives inside here. Again, it's like a blob, like an amoeba, a protozoan. And these are very numerous in the world ocean. As it turns out, these foraminifera, or forams for short, their shells, the species of foraminifera, and their shells change depending on temperature. So with different temperatures in the ocean, we get different kinds of species. And that really shouldn't be such a, a stretch for you to imagine that. Different plants and animals occur in different parts on Earth, depending, different places on Earth, depending on Earth's temperature. So forams in the ocean are the same kind of way. When we looked at the isotopic composition of those shells, now we got to go back to our earlier chapter when we talked about isotopes. So we're talking about differences in the numbers of protons in a substance. So same element, in this case it would be oxygen. We'll look at that in just a minute. The different isotopes of oxygen change in response to seawater temperature. So the seawater temperature under which the shell formed will have a different isotopic ratio depending on the temperature. And that was discovered by a very famous micropaleontologist, Cesare Emiliani. And when he discovered that, the different oxygen isotopes of the 4M shells changed according to seawater temperature. He knew that you could use that isotopic ratio to say something about ocean temperatures in the past. This process or this procedure of using something like oxygen isotopes or using something like tree rings or using any other kind of indicator in a sense of a climate process is called a proxy. And proxies are really important in a sense for allowing us to infer Earth's past climate. In fact, much of what we know about Earth's past climate, at least beyond a couple hundred years since we've been measuring climate on our planet, measuring te Earth's temperature and other things, much of what we know about Earth's past, past climate comes from the study of proxies. So you'll hear that word, and it's a very important word, and it's important to remember that we're using one thing, in this case, the oxygen isotopes of foraminifera shells, to say something about seawater temperature, but tree rings are just as useful, and other kinds of isotopes and other kinds of measures or proxy measures. As an example, I like to use Pinocchio. If you think about Pinocchio's nose, it got longer or shorter, depending on whether he was telling the truth or lying, okay? So the longer you saw Pinocchio's nose, the more you knew he was lying. A proxy's a lot like that. Okay, that may be beating it to death. Here is Cesare Emiliani, the father of paleoceanography and you can look him up on Wikipedia as a fascinating history. He looks just like a scientist, like you might expect. Here are the, isoto the uh, isotopes of oxygen, and if, again, if you go back to chapter two and review this figure, it will help you understand the different kinds of isotopes of oxygen. Here we have oxygen 16, which is a normal regular state. Oxygen 18 is a stable isotope of oxygen, and it's really these two that are used to figure out what the seawater temperature was. So looking at how much of this and how much of that, 
the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18, we can tell something about the temperature of the water in which that shell formed. Okay, still with me? When Emiliana did that and published his results in 1954, he got a graph that looks something like this. And there are only three data points. Of course, doing these analyses, particularly in the 1950s, were very laborious. So he didn't have a lot of data. But here you can see back some past 30 million years ago, seawater temperatures were above 10 degrees centigrade. 20 million years ago, seawater temperatures were some 7 degrees centigrade. And a few million years ago, seawater temperatures were just a couple degrees centigrade. And this is in the deep Pacific. Now one thing you notice is that temperatures are going down. And actually that's to be expected because we're leaving an ice age from 10 to 12,000 years ago. So since we warmed up 10 to 12,000 years ago and, I, and the ice age ended, our temperatures have been slowly going down. Okay, And so you can see here's modern times, the average temperature. And this occurs throughout Earth's history. We have ice ages and we have different periods of time when Earth's temperature and of course then seawater temperatures were different. So this gives us some confidence that we can trace back to seawater temperatures using something, using a proxy like the shells of Foraminifera. If we take a longer look back, if we here we're looking at 900,000 years ago and look at the oxygen isotopes in Foraminifera shells, here's the patterns that are revealed. Here was the latest ice age. We see other ice ages occurring. More ice, ice age, ice age, ice age, ice age, ice age. Less ice, so these would be the ends of ice ages. You can see here, we're leaving an ice age. It may be in fact that humans, by warming the planet, are preventing an ice age. Unfortunately, we're warming it faster than the planet can keep up with, so the problem may be we're making it too warm. But here you see more ice or less ice, depending on the ratio of oxygen, 18, and this traces very well what we know about ice ages, and it traces very well something called the Milankovitch cycle, which is a regular cycle of the sun and Earth and its orbit, and you can read about that in the book. We're not going to go into it in any, de any detail right here. Okay, well, all you need to know is that the Milankovitch cycle plays a role in climate. It has to do with how much sunlight hits Earth at any given time, and it has scales of 20 and 40 and 100,000 years, and we see that quite regularly. It influences ice ages, but it's not the only thing that influences ice age. We also know that the amount of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases also help determine Earth's global climate. So all of these things go into our climate system, but the take home message here is really that we can use sediments. We can use the shells of foraminifera in this case, and other properties of sediments to tell us something about Earth's past. And that's really the take home message that I wanna give you here now, because that's the most important one to let you know that this is how we're studying Earth's geologic past, by looking at sediments and looking at some of the isotopic ratios of some of the elements in the living um, organisms or the past living organisms. Okay, as a result of those studies, what we've discovered is something that might be a little bit alarming to us. Climate can change abruptly, and it really wasn't until the last few decades that we realized that climate can suddenly change on a scale of maybe 10 to 20 to 40 years, climate can become very different on our planet. In fact, maybe you saw a movie that was just about that phenomenon, the movie Day After Tomorrow. This abrupt climate change, which was uh, discovered in 1988 in deep sea cores, revealed rapid cooling on the order of thousands of years. And now scientists have even traced it back to where we realize that abrupt climate change can happen on the order of decades. And it's those tipping points, it's that shift into a completely different kind of climate that has scientists worried as well. And of course, if you saw the day after tomorrow, well, you know what it could be like, right? So let's hope we don't go there. 